Hello everyone, I am George from Ireland. So here I am in the palace of Versailles and not even halfway around it. Uh, anyway, it is more resplendent than I can possibly limb. It's just jam packed with um, uh, objets d'art and there are um, all these oil paintings and statues. Some of them are depicting scenes from classic mythology, some of them from 17th and 18th century France, portraits of people, biblical scenes, and on and on. Okay, as they would say, it's un embarrassement de richesse. I mean, uh, look around you, this huge relief sculpture of Louis XIV, an equestrian one, and he's got his slain enemies under his horse's hooves and so on. Um, so there's just so much detail. You'll often see the double L um, entwined, like a backwards L with a forwards L for Louis. And there's sometimes I've even seen LP for Louis Philippe, the last king of France, who was um, uh, the, the, the king of the July monarchy overthrown in uh, March 1848. Um, so uh, what else about this place? We've been through the king's bedchamber, through the throne room or the, the Apollo hall, which is quite small, and many, many rooms. Uh, so it, it's really a, a tour of um, French history at that time, statues of all the kings of France, going back to the very earliest ones, uh, the Merovingian kings, the Carolingian kings, Pepin the Short and so on. And out here you can see this uh, reflecting lake, it's landscaped um, dead ahead, um, the lake going down there. So St. Petersburg, Karlsruhe, Washington DC, were all to some extent modeled on this idea of a purpose-built capital. Um, it's all symmetrical and so on. Um, and it's just on such a grand scale. So it's unutterably uh, magnificent. And you think what um, absolute penury most people were living in, they had to try to survive the most ghastly hovels, um, uh, freezing and moaning in winter and sometimes boiling in the summer. And there was this just unworldly, well, not otherworldly, uh, luxury here and just words words fail me when I try to limit. You could spend all week going around here and just look how long this chamber is here. I think we're coming into the Hall of Mirrors. Then we've got all the um, chandeliers here and the mirrors obviously reflect the light, amplify the light, natural light and from the chandeliers and so on. So we have um, kings of France in the guise of ancient Roman emperors and such like. And when they show them in their 17th century dress, they're obviously all wearing these um, usually gray or white wigs, occasionally brown wigs, well past the shoulders, often in high heels, as with the won't, and wigs and things like that, wearing makeup, seemingly a very effeminate age. So um, uh, Louis the um, uh, 14th, um, he was, uh, he, he and his wife notoriously um, um, hated each other. Uh, and then an absolute miracle that, um, uh, that, that, that they had a child. Louis the, uh, sorry, Louis the Fourteenth, that is. Louis the Fourteenth, um, his brother Philippe um, was gay, founder of La Comédie Française, that uh, famous theatre company which is, which is going to this day. So he did so many other things, founding Les Invalides for um, officers who'd been disabled in war, and the uh, Royal Hospital Chelsea is based on that, as in retirement home for old soldiers. Les Invalides is, of course, the resting place of Napoleon Bonaparte, who had helped to overthrow the Bourbon dynasty right at the end. Um, I'm just trying to think of any other things he did. Founding L'Académie Française, which still exists, edits the French dictionary, been working on it since the 1930s. Uh, so you can tour the grounds of this place as well, and there's so much more to see. You could easily spend a week here, going to some of the other palaces, Grand Trianon, Petit Trianon, going to the kitchen gardens where provender for the royal household was, was made. So uh, several thousand aristocrats lived here. They weren't here all the year round. They came and went, sometimes going back to their country estates. But travel in France before the 19th century was very rough indeed. The roads often hadn't been um, properly worked on since Roman times. There was La Corvée, unpaid forced labor on the roads for the third estate. That's to say everyone below um, uh, clerical and aristocratic rank. So strictly speaking, even wealthy businessmen were, third, were members of the third estate, but they could buy their way out of such menial toil and uh, uh, peasants, that was most people, the unfree, they had to do it because most people lived in semi-slavery. And look at the ceiling above. Isn't it staggering? There was this um, uh, just absolutely <laughs> breathtaking opulence. And yet uh, most people, as I said, uh, lived in the most abject poverty. And why is it that we celebrate and perpetuate um, extreme inegalitarianism in terms of wealth and power? It seems to be, seems to be the tendency. And of course, the religious authorities giving that their imprimatur, saying it's a moral imperative to maintain this as the natural and settled order of things. And look over there, these scenes, one of these blokes 
arms bound with some sort of ivy or something like that. You see the fasces behind him on the left, as in the bundle of rods, that symbol of ancient Roman power. You know, the quaestors used to carry them, these, um, these judges. I wonder why they're looking away. They've got all these ancient Roman helmets, suits of armor, spears and so on. And then the two angels blasting their trumpets and holding out one a wreath of victory for the king and the other on a branch for peace. Anyway, I could talk about it almost all day. We've got the double-headed eagle of Austria up ahead, his sometime enemy. And the Roman family was, this is the, the, not the Roman, the Bourbon family sometimes married into them. And this Roman Empire, I don't know who, ever who, who he was, but look, they got SPQR, as in the initials of Senatus Ac Populosque um, Roma. Is that right? The Senate and people of Rome. Well, he certainly wasn't into, into uh, republicanism. Okay, Rome became an emperor later on, but wanted to claim to be the new emperor. His uh, most uh, Christian majesty, the king of France. France being the first daughter of the church. Catholicism being the state religion, the mightiest Catholic state. But uh, Louis the Sixteenth, he did, he did flirt with Gallicanism. It's going to be like the French version of Anglicanism. They would keep all the rituals, all the reassuring doctrines, the vestments and so forth, the festivals. That's what people identify with. That's what they're attached to and provides them some sort of uh, consolation in times of trouble. But they would just make the king in charge of the church. It would be Catholic, but not Roman Catholic. He would appoint the bishops and archbishops could, could appropriate some ecclesiastical property and the, the, the funds would be flowing into his treasury. Do what the king of England had done. He didn't do it at the end. And, but he was persuaded by the ultra-Catholic party to revoke the Treaty of Nantes in 1685. As in the Huguenot minority, Protestants were suddenly to be discriminated against. They longed to have their places of greater safety, as in their fortresses, particularly around La Rochelle, Navarre, and close to the Swiss border, heavily discriminated against, as were Jews and indeed actors. Though the theatre was very popular, it was seen as not quite respectable, disapproved of actors and it couldn't be buried in consecrated ground, and actresses were, were regarded as little better than prostitutes. So Louis XVI was a notorious philanderer and had a number of loved children with his mistresses. He'd also have a maîtresse en titre, his official mistress. They were, they were completely open about it. And of course, the Catholic Church didn't criticize him, despite him supposedly setting a moral example for people, but being openly adulterous. Well, that's just a little bit about, um, about uh, Versailles. I'll switch it off now.